author, was first author of the landmark report showing that bacteria could be induced to make proinsulin. This was the first time a mammalian hormone was synthesized by bacteria. And this research uh, is largely credited with leading to the birth of the biotech industry. She's held faculty positions at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and Harvard Medical School. Her research contributions include transforming growth factor alpha and epidermal growth factor during fetal and neonatal development, the identification of several pro proteins involved in vision development of animals, and the discovery that amyloid beta, a protein associated with Alzheimer's disease, is toxic to neural cells. Uh, Dr. Via Komarov has also served as VP for research at Northwestern University and VP of research and was COO of the Whitehead Institute. She's served on advisory committees for the NIH, the NSF, and the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. She's represented small business for the State Department at an Asian Pacific Economic Conference, and she serves on many academic advisory boards. She's a fellow in Association of Science and the Association for Women in Science. She's a quite a list of accolades. She's been elected to the Hispanic Engineer National Thank Achievement Hall of Fame. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Hello. Am I cutting off? Uh, no, you're okay. Uh, oh. For the attendees, if you could please make sure that you're muted, that would be great. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> uh, she's been elected to the Hispanic Engineer National Achievement Hall of Fame a Lifetime Achievement Award by Hispanic Business Magazine, the 2013 Woman of Distinction from the American Association of w University Women, and is the 2016 recipient of the Elting Morrison Prize from the MIT Program in Science and Tech. She's one of 11 women scientists profiled on the website of the White House Office of Science and Tech during the Obama administration. And lastly, if you wanna hear more from her after this event, she's going to be speaking at a roundtable discussion hosted by the U of Sackness chapter and the biomedical diversity community this Thursday at, 11, uh, at 1 p.m. If you're interested, please email me or opportunity. And if you can't attend, she was also a PBS series called Discovering Women, and her research was the subject of a one-hour segment entitled DNA Detective. It's truly an honor to be Dr. Lydia Villacomera to you all. And I'm going to pass the mic to you. Thank you, Ayumi. I'm delighted to be here. I'm just sorry that I can't be with you in person, uh, but perhaps another time. I'm particularly glad to be here because coming to UW as a freshman was an important step in my life and career. So what I'm gonna do today is describe my journey and some of the lessons I've learned along the way so that maybe you guys can uh, take a few shortcuts that I missed. Like most Americans, I come from a diverse genetic background mostly Spanish and indigenous Mexican Indian, but also Arabic, African, Asian, and Jewish with just a little Neanderthal sprinkled everywhere. Although my European genes constitute the majority of my genetic heritage, I identify and then identified as a Chicana, a Mexican American. Both of my parents were the college graduates. They were each the first in their family to go to college. I was born while they were in college and one would take classes in the morning and one would take classes in the afternoon so that someone would be home with me. My paternal grandparents came from Mexico during the Mexican Revolution. My grandfather had no European blood. He was pure Indian. My father grew up in this house, no running water, uh, no and dirt floors. My aunt painted this. My mother's forebears on both sides of the family came to the New World from the Basque region of Spain with the conquistadores. My maternal great-grandfather's sons joined him on the ranch in Arizona as soon as they had mastered basic arithmetic and reading, but he sent his daughters to normal school uh, for teacher training after high school because he didn't want them to marry cowboys. Like my mother, my grandmother, who was a single mom, worked most of her life. She moved in with us when I was in grade school and was an important part of our lives. I'm the eldest of six. My father had nine sibs, my mother had three. We are a very large extended family. I have over a hundred first cousins and 17 nieces and nephews, I call them nips, and 30 grand nieces and nephews. I decided I wanted to be a scientist early and by high school, I was the only girl in the physics class. Times have changed, I hope. I applied to UW because my father had a brother in Seattle. I started as a chem major, but I had trouble with the first semester's classes. 
when I went to see my advisor, he said, of course you're having trouble. Women don't belong in chemistry. I didn't question him and I can't remember his name. I just changed my major several times. And I finally settled on biology where there were young and enthusiastic faculty who encouraged me and actually expected me to do well. As a sophomore, I met uh, Tony Komaroff, a medical student who wasn't at all surprised that I wanted to be a scientist. So when he went to NIH after he graduated, I transferred to Goucher College. One of my professors suggested that I go to Johns Hopkins, but they didn't accept women then, and Goucher was their sister college. There, I worked with Dr. Gardner Moment and he taught the people in his lab to cherish our exceptions, an invaluable lesson for a budding scientist. I got a summer job at NIH with Dr. Loretta Levy, one of the first women to run a lab at NIH, and she was responsible for getting me into MIT. I had applied to every graduate school in Boston except MIT, and when I asked, uh, when Loretta asked for references, she, uh, when she asked me for the forms, I, she said, where's MIT? And I said, I can't go to MIT. I'm not good at math. She said, you told me you wanted to be a molecular biologist. MIT has the best program in molecular biology in the nation and probably in the world. If you're serious about becoming a molecular biologist, you need to at least apply to MIT. So I did somewhat reluctantly. And it was a good thing that I did because MIT was the only place in Boston that accepted me. It taught me an important lesson. You're not gonna get what you don't ask for or apply for. Tony and I were married the day after I graduated and we moved to Boston. My graduate class was uh, unusually small. There were only 15 of us. We didn't do rotations then. We all took classes together and then we chose a lab in January. We met as a group and we worked out what labs we wanted to be in so that new, no two of us would approach the same lab. I went to go see David Baltimore who worked on viruses and who later won the Nobel Prize for discovering an enzyme that copied RNA into DNA. He told me he had no room in his lab. At the time, he and Harvey Lodish shared an open lab and office space. So I went to Harvey and proposed that I do a joint project on poliovirus with the two of them at the time, poliovirus was being studied in David's lab and Harvey was interested in selfie protein synthesis. Harvey agreed, so I went back to David and that's how I became the first graduate student in biology at MIT to have two thesis advisors. Poliovirus has a very long genome. It's an RNA of 7,500 bases and it's the, it's a, the, the strand that is messaged. So the question was, was there internal initiation of protein synthesis on this long RNA, which is sort of antithetical to what people thought at the time? Or is there a single initiation site that uh, makes a polyprotein that's later um, processed? So that was gonna be my project. So the first uh, task, of course, was to set up the controls. So David gave me a stock of EMC virus. It's very similar to poliovirus, but it had been successfully translated in uh, uh, cell-free systems from rat ascites cells. So I took the EMC and all the recipes um, and he said, polio is so similar to EMC, it should be no problem to isolate EMC using the same recipe that we use for polio virus. Well, I made the reagents, grew up the ascites cells, infected them, made a crude lysate, applied them to a sucrose gradient and got no virus. I repeated with the same results. And so I went to David and he said, you've probably made a reagent incorrectly, go do it again. So I did with the same result. This time, however, I decided to change the recipe. Um, I thought, well, this recipe for poliovirus calls for SDS, which is very strong detergent. Maybe, maybe EMC is more sensitive. So I substituted NP40 and I got virus. I was really happy because we all knew at that point that David who hadn't yet gotten the prize would at some point. So that taught me that, you know, you have to ask people for advice that you respect. On the other hand, you do have to think for yourself and you always have to do the experiment. So for my thesis, I used a methionine that labeled all of the poliovirus proteins. 
And then I used a modified methionine, which I got from some colleagues in chemistry. And we used that to show that there was only a single initiation site in the poliovirus protein. And that was later shown to be processed during the process of translation in David's lab. Towards the end of my graduate studies, I presented my thesis at the FACEP meeting, a joint meeting of several biological societies. Actually, Harvey gave me a deal. He said, if you go to the FACEP meeting, then we'll, let you, we'll send you to the ski meeting in Squaw Valley. That was a no-brainer. That meeting was fortuitous because that's where I met for the first time other Mexican-American and Native American scientists. I didn't know they existed. And that's where we established SACNAS. The only other woman at that meeting was a member of the, one of the agencies. And I was, of course, a graduate student. As you heard, SACNAS is now 47 years old and it's become the most diverse scientific society dedicated to attracting and encouraging young people from all groups, historically underrepresented. After I received my PhD, I went to Harvard for a postdoc, first in Photos Cafados lab on the development of the silk moth eggshell, a really beautiful structure. And Aetis Stratiatus, a crazy Greek, was my uh, lab mate. My project depended on connecting moth egg DNA to bacterial DNA to isolate and characterize moth eggshell genes. This kind of work was then banned in Cambridge because of concerns that the technology was dangerous. So I joined Tom Maniatis, who had moved his lab to Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories in New York, since all of the work he wanted to do depended on this at the time new technology. Well, it was a bad year for me, nothing worked. And that was not good because, of course, getting a, a job at a university and setting up my own lab depended on having publications for my postdoctoral work. Meantime, Arge was working with Wally Gilbert, and as I was getting ready to return to Boston, he urged me to join their effort to make an insulin bacterial DNA recombinant. Well, I might not have gotten any publishable results at Cold Spring Harbor, but I had become very good at connecting DNA and making clones. So, and furthermore, I was given a small sample of all of the enzymes in the Cold Spring Harbor refrigerator. Uh, remember, at that time, many enzymes, especially restriction enzymes, were not commercially available. That refrigerator at Cold Spring Harbor was basically Rich Roberts' freezer and the beginning of what we now know as New England Biolabs. And there were no kits. We did everything from purifying our uh, DNA and RNA to radio labeling. We used lots of radio label in those days, our own uh, uh, triphosphates. So I joined the Gilbert team. And six months later, we not only had the uh, a bacterial DNA recombinant, one of those clones in bacteria produced insulin. And we got three patents out of that, which later led to some very interesting work for me as a uh, an expert witness in patent trials. That was fun. And perhaps we can talk about that more day after tomorrow. Well, Wally always used to say that it's as hard to solve a trivial problem as an important problem. So you might as well go for an important problem. And so I'm going to describe the experiments we did then briefly, because I think they illustrate the importance of not only picking an important problem, but one that's accessible with a combination of technologies from old, very old technologies, current technologies, and things that you may have to develop yourself. Bill Chick at the Joslin Clinic had lethally irradiated a set of rats, and then he saved them by connecting their circulatory system to that of a healthy rat. This is called parabiosis. In one such pair, a tumor that produced insulin arose, and that became our source of RNA. But we knew that pro-insulin RNA is only a few percent of all protein coding RNA, not only in this tumor, but in the pancreas too. So Arch copied a total prep of RNA into double-stranded DNA, and I inserted it into a plasmid that had two drug resistance genes, such that any plasmid, any bacteria that got a plasmid with an insert would be resistant to one drug, but not the other. We first identified plasmids with inserted sequences that could be identified with radio labeled DNA made from total RNA from the tumor. We then picked a random assortment of varying intensities of these clones and tested them 
um, in a system, a cell-free system. And what we were doing was making insulin. We take RNA from the tumor as our control. And with antibody, you could pull down any insulin that was produced. Um, so that if a plasmid that had coded for insulin was introduced into that system, it would inhibit the synthesis of insulin. And we got one such clone and we were very lucky. It actually happened in the first 10 clones that we, I, that we analyzed and we had about 1700 clones total. We then used that clone to identify in this set all of the insulin coding clones. clones. We got 48, it was about 2.5%. And we later found that the insulin RNA in this RNA was only about 3%. 0.3% of the RNA. So somewhere along the line, we got some enrichment. Now, one of these 48 clones turned out to be producing pro-insulin in bacterial cells. And in this case, both serendipity and foresight were important in finding that clone. I, being uh, fearful of lose, missing something, always plated my clones on both antibiotics even when we were growing clones that we knew had an insert. And Stephanie Broom, also in Wally's lab, had developed procedures that forced proteins out of a bacterial uh, uh, cell into the space between the cell uh, protein and the cell wall. And using antibodies, she could then show that she could detect those proteins. Um, and then the, another part of what turned out to be luck was that there was an epic snowstorm in Boston. That was the great snowstorm of 1978 and it closed the city down. The National Guard were called out and you couldn't go anywhere. Uh, you couldn't go anywhere anywhere because the roads were impassable. As soon as the roads cleared, my husband was a doctor. So he got to travel to the hospital. I hitched a ride with him to the lab. And when I got into the lab, things had been allowed to grow longer than they ordinarily would. And I saw that I had a clone that was growing in the presence of an antibiotic that it should not have. I got very excited um, because I immediately concluded that we were making insulin in that bacteria. Well, to prove that, we took uh, that clone and others and we plated them on a, back on a plate and then we tickled them with Stephanie's method, which by the way, was a very old method from the 30s and, and uh, 40s. And we overlaid those tickled uh, bacterial colonies with a piece of plastic that was coated with antibody to insulin, cold. Then we lifted off that plastic layer and floated it on another bath of, of labeled antibody in this case. And it could be either labeled antibody against insulin or labeled antibody against penicillin. And then we would look at the x-rays and we would get something like this. In fact, these are exactly the results we got the first time we did the experiment. We spent about three months trying to get this result cleaner and we couldn't, so we ended up publishing our initial results. There's a very faint clone that you can see here. That turns out to be the clone called PI-47. Um, if you use the first antibody as insulin and the second antibody as anti-penicillinase. This is the control where we put a little nanoliter of uh, beta-lactamase. So clearly we were getting a strong reaction. The rest of the stuff on this filter is junk. Here's what happens if you have a duplicate of that filter uh, where insulin, anti-insulin is the second labeled antibody. And here you see the same clone labeled, a little bit of residual background where the beta-lactamase is and some more junk. Um, we then took that clone and uh, asked what was going on there. And we were indeed making a hybrid protein where we had uh, beta-lactamase or, or penicillinase attached to pro-insulin. And we can discuss the ins and out of that in questions if you wish. So with that paper under my belt, it took six months from the time I entered the project until the time we published the paper. Uh, and it was a rather wild time because Wally called us uh, after we wrote the paper, we finished it. He went home at about 10, 30, 11, told us to finish the paper, and then we should meet him the next morning at a legal office. And that was where he was doing patents for this thing. So, but anyway, with that paper under my belt, I became an assistant professor at UMass Medical School in Worcester. 
Tony, my husband meantime, was a faculty member at Harvard Medical School. So we also had a solution to the two body problem that many professional couples, particularly academics face. Eight years later, I received tenure. After making essentially all the mistakes that women and individuals from historically marginalized uh, groups and other folks who just don't know what the rules are make. I was on entirely too many university committees. I developed and taught more courses than all of my colleagues. I didn't publish enough. In other words, I didn't know that I could say no. And so I neglected the primary responsibility of every new faculty member, publish. So that was a, a tough lesson. And a year after I was tenured, I accepted a non-tenured position at Harvard Medical School and Children's Hospital. And I had a wonderful decade there with good friends uh, who were my graduate students, some undergraduates, postdocs, collaborators, even one of my nephews came and spent the year in the lab. And many of the papers that we generated during that time, to my great delight and surprise, continue to be cited even in the current literature. Well, I was better at balancing my research with academic administrative work at, at Harvard and Children's, but you know, I really didn't say no often enough still. And after eight years uh, of this, I decided something needed to change. Now, initially I thought I'd return to the lab full-time and I'd concentrate on one of these areas that we had been working on. Um, but after talking to a lot of people seeking their advice, I began to think that maybe it was time to move to a position where I could use my administrative skills and broad interests. So as a direct result of those discussions, I got a call from a headhunter looking to fill a position as Associate VP of Research Administration at Northwestern University in Evanston in Chicago. My first reaction, I have to say, was why would I want to go to Chicago? I, by the way, had only been to O'Hare. But the headhunter told me, said, look, you don't have to take this job, but if you want a job like it, you have to look at this job. Well, that made sense. So I went to look and I met Bill Kern, who was the VP at the time, a theoretical chemist. Uh, and I met other members of the administration and members of the faculty. I took the job and Tony and I commenced a seven year commuter marriage because there was no way he was going to leave his position at Harvard, which was absolutely perfect for him. Bill Kern was a spectacular mentor in the administrative arena, um, on par with Wally Gilbert, Harvey Lodish, David Baltimore in, in his arena. So two years of, after uh, I got there and he retired, I was appointed vice president for research after a national search. I loved that job. It was a great, it was a position where my broad interest became a strength. Um, it taught me to appreciate work in all areas of scholarship, and I had the resources to make strategic investments in faculty and students, thanks to President Beenan's uh, a great ability as a fundraiser. While I was there, Don Jacobs, the Dean Emeritus of the Business School, invited me to attend the one-month, 24-7 advanced executive program. My classmates in that program came from all over the world, and they were all uh, mid-high career uh, industry people, except for the folks who ran the uh, administrative architects building in Shanghai. So that course was invaluable in filling in some holes in my business knowledge, and it certainly taught me what I needed to know about finance, which was mostly be sure you have somebody who really understands finance with you, whatever job you take. Well, after seven years, it was time to stop commuting and return to Boston. I had tried to uh, recruit the biological superstar Susan Lindquist to Northwestern, but she ended up recruiting me to the Whitehead Institute where she had become the first woman director. So during my time at the Whitehead, I joined my first corporate board. And after a year, I became chair of the board a very engaging and involved story for another time. Susan decided to return to the bench full-time after three years, and I moved to the corporate world, joining a company that had been started by Wally Gilbert's son, John. This is an illustration of the power of networking and keeping in touch with people that you know. Uh, John, on the basis, the company had been fun, founded on the basis of a microfluidic fluidic rapid switch that he invented. In the channel of the microsorter, 
Cells in the middle of the flow pass the laser in a detection zone. If the cell is desired, it gets kicked into a different region of flow so that it moves into a, a separate fluid path into the selection chamber while all the unselected cells remain in place and flow into a waste chamber. Each microchannel was equivalent to a standard sorting concept. With it, he envisioned a multi-channel chip that could be used to sort cells for cell therapy in a multi-chambered uh, sterile cartridge using a modified cell sorter, laser sorter. This was in 2002, before cell therapy was really taken very seriously. At that point, people were saying cell therapy is the greatest thing on the horizon and it always will be. Well, six months after John, uh, after I joined the company, John decided that he would become the, we switched roles. I became the CEO, he became the CTO. After a year, John decided to go off and uh, keep founding companies. Cytonome had been the third company he started. And there I was, and I had to find funding for Cytonome. This is where persistence learned as a graduate student and postdoc and as a student, and maybe in life, comes in. I pitched the company over 200 times in, during the Great Recession. And after one early unsuccessful round, I had to lay off half of the employees of Cytonome. The three of us who were executives took no salary, and two angel investors and I, all members of the board, put in enough money to keep the company afloat. Because remember, the first rule of starting a, uh, or keeping going a company is don't run out of money, don't run out of money, and whatever you do, do not run out of money. Well, for I used home equity, for example. There were several um, counts against the company. First, I was a first time CEO, a woman, an older woman at that, a molecular biologist leading an engineering company. Second, the company was building a machine. We thought of it as a, a disruptive technology. Funders thought of it as another machine. And those are not usually very high profit, but it was taking as long as a drug to develop. Um, the engineering required could all be based on known technologies, but it was pretty much at the edge in several aspects. And it proved hard to get the optics, fluidics, and mechanics to work in that blue box. However, in March 2009, we signed an agreement with a company based in Texas and formed Cytonome ST LLC as a subsidiary of Sexing Technologies. John Sharp, an, an electrical engineer with extensive experience in building cell sorters, became CEO, and I remained a CSO and board member. Sexing Technologies' business was the sale of bull sperm carrying the X chromosome. Juan Moreno and Maurice Rosenstein in Texas started ST to provide sex sperm to dairy farmers. The dairy cow has to be replaced every three years. And so, and dairy farmers are not interested in bulls, they want females. And at the time, most breeders out there sold unsorted bull sperm but they weren't too happy about the farmers <clears throat> getting bulls either because they wanted those genetics in their own little hands. So Juan Moreno, a clever guy, had figured out how to sort uh, sperm. This is not trivial because the sperm are flat like a hand and they must be oriented precisely or else the laser will hit them wrong and you'll get uh, an ambiguous result. And there's only a 4% difference in DNA content between a male and a female sperm. But he'd worked that out. And he had bought every used MoFlo on the market because he didn't want to pay for new ones. Uh, and John, who had helped build the MoFlo, was a consultant. And the two of them sort of floated around looking for promising technologies. John immediately put the team to work on building a reliable sorter for ST well, we continued to work on the uh, gigasort, the therapeutic sorter. In May of 2011, the first sperm sorter was installed at, in Navasota, Texas, and we had a working uh, gigasort prototype by 2012 and published uh, the description of the machine and what it could do a couple of years later. So in 2014, after nine years and three logos, I left management at Cytonome. In addition to the Gigasort at that point, the company had developed a prototype of a tabletop droplet sorter that fits in a containment hood. 
Uh, what the company needs to do with that is find someone who can manufacture it reliably. Uh, also developed an industrial cell sorter that can be just customized for uh, specific uses. It's really based on the uh, sorter that we send for sperm. And we've shipped over 300 and I think it's 325 now sperm sorters all over the world for ST genetics, formerly sexing technologies. And ST has now become the premier uh, sperm seller in the world for cows. And now they're getting into uh, beef cows as well. So interesting partnerships. When you think outside of the box, uh, strange things happen. The Gigasort is in use in Japan right now for a clinical trial that will use differentiated pluripotent cells for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. The first patient has been injected. Uh, the second patient probably won't be happening for a while. And depending on the outcome of that trial, uh, we will either have a market for the Gigasort or we won't. So after a year of being semi-retired, I was tired of introducing myself as a former this and that. So I established a one person company to be an umbrella for my activities. And so I serve on committees as you've heard and boards and give talks at different institutions, some like this, some in companies. Um, at this point, I'm focused on issues that account for the slow change in representation in colleges and universities and companies despite the fact that there's rapidly changing demographics of the country and that the need for talent has never been greater. And this began for me because I was asked to co-chair a, a meeting on minority women in STEM for the National Academies of Science. And my first reaction was another one. We have done quite a few of these. My co a uh, uh, chairman in that endeavor was a woman uh, who was the vice president of research at Howard University and a psychologist. And she pointed out to me that we, the natural scientists, had uh, a habit of getting together to discuss this problem, which we all agreed, or for the most part, was a problem, and we wanted to do something about it. And we attempted to reinvent the wheel. And she pointed out a little bit acerbically that perhaps if we utilize the knowledge about human behavior that had been accumulated over the past umpty -ump years, we might make more progress. So uh, with her encouragement, I began to look into that. And my role now is to introduce people who don't have time to do that to what those findings are and how rigorous they can be. And these are the books that were the beginning of my education in this area. I won't describe them now, except to say that Think, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman was really quite a remarkable book for me. Kahneman is a Nobel Prize winning behavioral economist who was interested in why human beings make really silly financial decisions. And this book describes the 30 years of work with him and his partner, uh, Amos Tversky. Tversky died before the Nobel Prize was awarded. And these others are all books uh, which are related in one way or another. Kahneman's book is very big. Michael Lewis's book is short and a very good read. You may remember Moneyball. He's the guy who wrote that. And this is a good way to get introduced to what Kahneman has to say. So let me give you a brief preview of that talk before I conclude. Um, this slide summarizes uh, my synthesis of the work done by social scientists, behavioral neuroscientists, imagers, psychologists, and others. And what it boils down to is that the human brain is a, quite a remarkable uh, thing that we have here. But nevertheless, it, and no brain in fact, can deal with all of the data that it receives from the world through senses. It cannot deal with all that sensory input. It's the uh, mother of all data problems. So it has to ignore or block much of that input. And as a result, we develop shortcuts that allow us to make decisions very rapidly, basically without thinking. Now, some of these shortcuts are hardwired through evolutionary experience. Uh, we're born with certain fears about things uh, and they're shared through evolution. You have, may have seen video of cats reacting when they're surprised by a cucumber. Um, this atavistic reaction may re re reflect response that they always have to snakes. Uh, chickens right out of a shell are afraid of spiders. Now, other shortcuts of this tort are formed in response to the culture in which we grow up. 
And the, perhaps one of the most important uh, things is that this making of shortcuts is a human property. All members of a culture are subject to these conscious or uh, implicit biases. And the first step in changing our behavior in response to them is to recognize that they exist. Now, all of you are familiar with optical illusions. Here's a very old one. Most, maybe all of you, will see these two tables as a different size. I see them as a different size, and I know they're not. They're the same size, and that can be illustrated by tracing one and then using our friend PowerPoint to rotate that tracing and slide it over the adjoining table. And it fits perfectly because they're the same size. But you probably still see them as different sizes. And you can repeat this um, on your own and see that I wasn't pulling any tricks. Our visual see system sees what it sees correctly, but the mind interprets them in accord with our experience. We have a two-dimensional system in our retina, uh, but our brain knows that we live in a 3D world. Well, implicit biases stem from associative errors. These are associations that we make. It's one way in which we can take shortcuts in thinking. Some associations we learn explicitly. If you're a musician, you learn to associate patterns of dot on a page with particular sounds or positions on your instrument. And when that knowledge becomes what we call automatic, you can make music. Some associations are learned as we're exposed to our society from family attitudes, from movies, TV, peers, news, who we see in various roles. One of my favorite stories about this role thing that brought home to me how important this can be is my nephew. My oldest nephew met the, his mother's two sisters when he was about four. And after spending a day with us, he went home and he said to his mom, oh, mom, I can't be a lawyer and I can't be a banker and I can't be a scientist because those are girls' jobs. So when young children don't see someone that they can identify with, um, they, may make, they may close doors that they don't even know are there. And this is why I think things like Star Trek and uh, whatever is current now are so important. To see the diversity there opens up possibilities to young children. Now, some of the associations we make may be counter to what we believe about ourselves. We all believe we're good people and that we are in this country, we believe that all people are created equal, but we grow up in a country in which that is demonstrably not true. And so when we see some people who are different in that way from us, our immediate response may be to think that they are, to make this association that is inappropriate, like women are not good at math. Asians are good at math. Blacks might be dangerous. Now, this is an evolutionary uh, thing that is necessary for us to deal with the bombardment of data that we get. But human beings are the most successful species in the world at compensating for evolutionary deficiencies. We didn't have fur, so we invented clothes. Uh, we learned how to use fire. We learned how to build shelter. Um, and you can go on and on like that. So it is my feeling that we can overcome this. Although there are many who argue you cannot change the associations that we have made, you can change behavior. If you go to this website that I have here, you can take uh, and find out, you can take a test anonymously and find your implicit association in 14 different areas. Um, you may be surprised, I was. Now, here's an example from an autobiography of implicit bias. Uh, this author, upon seeing a black pilot, started to panic and wondered, how can a black man fly an airplane? Who's the author? Nelson Mandela. So I think this helps point out how ubiquitous this is. It's a human property. And finally, I just remind you that there's a fair amount of work out there that says that diversity is a good thing for several reasons. One is teams that have diverse members bring different modes of thinking about a problem, and so you get a richer array of possible solutions. You may also get problems that you hadn't thought of when you have a group of people trying to think about what an interesting problem is. 
And this has become one of my favorite examples. Um, since Darwin, bird song was considered a male trait. And that's because um, most bird song was studied by male Europeans in temperate forests, where indeed males sing far more often than females. That began to, the, the makeup of ornithology began to change in the 90s. And uh, as women came on board, uh, there came on board also the appreciation of female birdsong. And so this paper that I'm citing here decided to look at birdsong papers over the last 20 years and ask who's the first author, men or women? And so what they found was that uh, most first authors on female birdsong were women, 68%, and middle authors also skewed towards uh, being women whereas senior authors were mostly men, indicating that in uh, late 20, when this was published, uh, people with positions of power tended to be male rather than female. Um, and so the entry of women can be correlated. There's no uh, necessarily proof, but it's an interesting correlation. Uh, that's when female Burke song began to be appreciated because somebody said, uh, how come we think only male birds can sing and maybe was also in a tropical forest where female birds sing a lot. The other thing I'd like to point out that the first author on this paper uh, is an under, was an undergraduate when it was done. And with that, I'd like to say thank you and I would be happy to take your questions, which I hope there are many of. And I'm gonna depend on my host to take the questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, what a wonderful talk. All right, uh, just a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, you can either put it in the chat or you can use the raise hand function and we will call on you. Uh, we'll see. And anything is fair game. <laughs> Uh, okay, it looks like we just got a question in, in the chat here. This is from James Lai. Um, just out of curiosity, your insulin work occurred during the similar time when uh, gene tech was going to start. Am I wondering, or I am wondering if there was any IP issue? Oh, there certainly was. There were three groups that were uh, competing to get insulin first, and each group won one part of the race. Uh, there was two groups in California, and we were on the East Coast. There was City of Hope, and then there was a UCSF uh, Genentech, although Genentech considers itself fairly separate. And in fact, some of the early patents were all around that. So the California group cloned the pro-insulin gene first. Uh, we got the first expression. Genentech got the first uh, human pro-insulin provided. And so our patent is actually not on insulin per se, but on using the uh, on getting the, the protein shipped out to the inter, inter, intracellular space by connecting it to a protein that will take it out there. And so that protein was, that patent uh, turned out to be very lucrative for us. The inventors, uh, it bought me my apartment, my condo in Chicago when I moved there and uh, was a very nice thing to have through the years. It also led to my being the expert witness as I had uh, alluded to a bit earlier because of that paper, uh, there was a, a related, a biogen related, because remember, biogen came out of the work that Wally was done in Wally Gilbert's lab. So I saw biogen grow from the time it was a bench in Wally Gilbert's lab to the behemoth that is now there in Kendall Square. And um, biogen had a case, which was not insulin, it was something else. And that was uh, disputed. And so I, a young lawyer associate in a patent firm in California called me up and said, we need an expert witness. Uh, I didn't know then, but she was a, a, a very strange woman. Like me, she decided what she wanted to be very early in life. And that was a patent lawyer. And she, by God, was a patent lawyer. Patent lawyers in those days were primarily male. And Mary Consolvi became the first female partner in that firm, which has now been uh, merged into a much larger firm. But anyway, she called me up 
and I became an expert witness and spent a week there uh, preparing. Patent lawyers work very hard. <laughs> they work as hard as scientists do uh, often. And so from there it took off and I spent a few years before I became vice president doing a fair amount of that. So yeah, there were a lot of IP issues. The, I, the insulin paper is mostly cited now in patents rather than in the scientific literature per se. Um, uh, there are still some issues outstanding. The patent, patenting has become more difficult. You can't do general patents anymore successfully. They're, they're much more targeted these days. Great, thank you. Do we have another question? I have a question, Dr. Viacoma, and thank you so much for such a wonderful talk. Um, I'm curious about, so obviously at the time in Cambridge, there was concern about the use of recombinant DNA technology. Um, did you have any concerns while you were doing this research and um, what was that like and how has that changed over the years? What's really interesting is that we are now in a similar time with genetically modified organisms, as they're now called, particularly in Europe, where there are people who do not want GMO anything, not wheat, not animals. Um, and so it, the, the attitude was a bit similar. I was not worried. I knew what these bugs were. And we had the, the, the bacteria, it was an E. coli strain, but the E. coli that we were using for these experiments were a special bug called 1776. It, had, it was a pathetic E. coli. Half of the genome had been eliminated from this thing. So if you look at it cross-eyed, it died. So I was totally not worried about getting ill from this particular bacterium. To me, it was like people who worried about it, it felt like they were saying you could take a lawnmower and turn it into a, fight, a, a, a Hauser tank. You know, just not gonna happen in a couple of steps. So, and I, I appreciate why people are worried about uh, ge genetically modified organisms because it's hard to explain how benign the changes are. When you introduce a single gene, especially now when it's much more targeted, early on in introducing genes, you didn't know where you were introducing them so you could have secondary effects. And that's still true, but it is much less true what with the, the newer technologies for introducing stuff. So it didn't bother me. The, the main bother was that it really made it hard to do work on certain things. Thank you. Okay, we've got another question in the chat here. This is from Stephanie Torres. Uh, what tips do you have for other underrepresented minorities who want to become leaders in their STEM field? The first job you have is to get to the table. You've made the first step. You're in graduate school or you're a postdoc or you're a student here. Uh, so you've made the first step in terms of being a, a person who's knowledgeable about the field. If you wanna be a leader in the field though, in any part of it, whether it's in the diversity part or in the science part, you have to get credibility. The reason that I can gain entree into places like Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories where the entire faculty came to hear me give an entire lecture on uh, implicit bias is because I have chips to cash. I have a reputation. Um, I'm a reasonably well-known scientist. I've done some decent work. And so they're willing to give me a listen. And that's really all I ask. So in order to get into the room where the decisions are made, you first have to have the credentials to get to the table. And so your first job now is to get those credentials and prove that you can do whatever you is that you have set out to do. Now you can take uh, uh, alternate roads off that direct line that we're also familiar with, which is bench research either in the university or in an industry um, and go directly into educational fields or into law or into other things like that where you can be very influential. If you can write well, that's one path. Um, if uh, you are inclined, there are, it's now very clear that we need more people trained in science in our legislative bodies at every level. That would be very useful to the society. Um, so there are many ways that you can do it and you kind of have to decide where you want to be. You know, it's, it's interesting that right now, the, um, if you look at uh, the new administration and some of the appointees there, 
the opportunities that exist. Eric Lander is a scientist sitting now in the, in the uh, as part of the cabinet, a scientist on the cabinet is really a quite a step forward. And so that's something to look forward to. Uh, but you have to be really, you have to have proven that you're really very good in order to get that particular place. But to sit on the places like I sit at, at the councils at NSF or NIH, you have to be a good scientist. And all of you already are pre-selected for the potential to be that. Awesome, thank you. And I, I'm gonna take this opportunity to uh, once again, plug the roundtable event with um, Dr. Vila Komarov, which will be on Thursday at 1 p.m. And I will put that sign up link again in the chat. Um, and I think there'll be probably more discussion about um, career paths and uh, similar topics. Um, great. Uh, do we have any other questions? Yeah, I have another kind of career path related question. Thank you, Dr. Yilkomarov. Really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Thank you. Um, my question is about mentorship. Um, so as you're reflecting back on your career, both uh, the mentorship you've received and you've given, um, can you talk about a, how you found the right mentors or, or, or mentees, and um, what role you think that's played? I think it's critically important. One of the reasons I show those pictures that I do in the talk of my mentors is that uh, there was only one woman other than my family, and all of the rest were white men. And I think this is critically important for uh, people uh, in underrepresented groups to recognize is that given the world as it is now, your mentors are more likely to not be like you. You have to find the people who are like you who understand what's going on with you. That's another kind of mentor. But for your science mentors, you wanna pick someone who is very good, but who doesn't make decisions based on what you look like or where you come from or what your economic background is. And I was in part lucky and in part I, because I grew up in a big family that didn't talk a whole lot about what was going on, you had to infer everything. And so I got a good feel for what was going on with people. And with a family as big as mine, you run into all types. And so I had exposure to a wide variety of kinds of people over time. So by the time I got to graduate school, um, I was no longer as naive as I was, for example, when that chemistry professor told me that women didn't belong in chemistry. Um, I looked out for people. And at the time, I'm not sure I could have even have verbalized it. But what I knew was that there were people in the department at MIT that I was not comfortable around. I didn't enjoy the back and forth with them. And there were other people who in some cases certainly were as smart, in some cases a lot smarter, with whom I didn't, I really enjoyed the back and forth. And the difference I've come to understand is that those people truly felt I was at MIT, I had been selected through their process, which was a rigorous one, and I belonged there. They didn't question that. The people I was not comfortable with didn't, weren't quite sure about that. And I felt it in their response. So certainly Wally Gilbert and David Baltimore were not uh, exactly fuzzy, friendly types. They were people who uh, more than once kicked my ass, I have to say. Uh, but I knew that the reason that they were doing that was because they expected that I could do as well as anybody and they wanted me to be uh, to do my best. And that's the distinction is people who believe that you have potential and want to help you reach it. Um, people who are putting you down, or, uh, which is different from criticism. Uh, but are the kinds of mentors that you need. You also need people to whom you can moan and go to for comfort, but that's, that's not the same people necessarily. And you never have just one mentor, you need several. For mentees, what you're looking for is, there's a wonderful author who says you're looking for that spark of something extra, that extra passion to, to want to learn something, a curiosity, uh, a willingness to work hard, persistence, all of those are very important traits 
in people that you want to mentor. And I have to say early on, I was not very good at that. Um, so that when I set up my lab initially, I was very, um, I was pretty easy on everybody and that's not good for anybody. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, I think we've got time for maybe one more question. Um, again, you can put it in the chat or you can uh, use the raise hand feature. Okay, looks like um, might be it here. So uh, once again, I would remind everyone that there is this event on Thursday at 1 p.m. Um, where you'll have the opportunity to uh, interact with Dr. Uh, Vilik Komarov more. Um, and so I would definitely encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, thank you again for the, the wonderful talk. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us this week. Um,